Good morning and welcome to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. It's heating up out there. We're actually in double digits. It's good. Please stand as we go into this morning's call to worship. You'll find the words to the call to worship on the slide behind me. From Psalm 65, verses 1 through 7. Praise awaits you, O God. Zion, to you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose to bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house and your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, turmoil in the nations. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We pray that our hearts are prepared to worship you. Uh, may the things that clutter our minds from the week past and the week ahead, um, we pray that you'll remove those, Father, so that we can focus on you, giving you the praise and adoration you so greatly deserve. We ask that your spirit would draw near to us, shape us, Move us, change us to be more like your son. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning we're starting our series on what Christians believe. Um, And the first topic in that series is the one true God. So as we sing, as we worship this morning, um, let that be our focus on our one true God. And with this first song, we're going to focus on his greatness, um, which is huge. So I can't, how do you even encapsulate that? Good luck with this sermon today, buddy. It's going to (laughs) be... All right, so let's uh, let's sing together as we sing How Great Is Our God.
Well, good morning. Welcome to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. If you are a visitor or guest with us today, please fill out one of the cards in the pew rack. And then following the service outside those doors, Ryan has a special gift for you out there. Do you know what? I have a special gift? Yeah, it's in those bags. You Is don't, it a you coffee don't even mug? Know. Yeah, there's a coffee mug in All right. there. I know you like coffee. But Absolutely. Lots of youth announcements. Lots of youth announcements. Okay. So I will try to make this quick. Uh, first of all, it was disappointing. We had to cancel our first week back, and it never happened. Um, but make sure to be here this Wednesday. We're starting a new series in Ephesians 4. Um, should be a good time. I don't know why I just said it should be a good time. That was kind of awkward. Um, also, thanks to all of the, you parents and students, mostly probably the parents that logged on and registered for the events on Wednesday. That really saved me a lot of headache. It also saved Rachel from getting 50 phone calls the next day about signing up for events. So thank you for that. If you registered for the Winter Jam, which is coming up this Friday, and haven't paid yet, we need your money by Wednesday. If you have it today, we have a table right out those doors with youth leaders to collect the money. We have a list of who registered but didn't pay. So if you registered but didn't pay, we need that by Wednesday, preferably today if you have it. Um, also for Winter Jam, we potentially have a few open seats on the bus. Um, so what, we, what we're going to do is set up a, a waiting list for lack of better terms, if you, if you didn't sign up but think you might want to go, check in with the youth leaders at the table, get on the list, or email me today, ryan at mgbconline.com, and we'll let you know if there's a seat available for you on the bus. Um, there's only a few left, if, if at all, so do that today. Also, winter retreat, same thing. If you registered but didn't pay yet, please pay by Wednesday or pay this morning out in the lobby after church. Uh, speaking of which, if you're a youth leader and you volunteered to help afterwards, um, try to duck out a couple minutes early if you can. Um, other people do that anyway. So duck out. <laughs> sorry. Duck out early, get to the table, and then, man, I am just rolling today. Yeah. Uh, you're going to kick me yeah. out of here. Yeah. Um, is Micah even here? Micah Langenfelder? Not here yet. He'll be at the table. Someone, can, he can you guys. Out a little early. Can you guys tell him to duck out a little early? Because he <laughs> apparently isn't, isn't going to get the message. Okay, moving along. Scholarship books. We're going to begin the scholarship program. We actually are going to start it today um, for those who would like to take notes on today's sermon, which again, good luck with the topic. Um, Thank you. Trying to explain the Trinity. That, that's, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I'm really, I really need to stop now. Um, we're going to start a scholarship program today. The books are $5. The reason being, we used to print them and give them out for free, and then the kids would lose them. Can I have another one? Can I have another one? No, you cannot, unless you pay another $5. So pay your $5, but then you can earn up to, I, I mean, I don't even know how, how high we go, $100 plus if you do the work in the book. Um, if you would like to participate in the scholarship program, you're in youth and don't have your book today, we have these handy-dandy little papers that you can take notes on. So can I have a couple youth leaders or just people in general help me with this? If you're in youth and want to take notes today, please raise your hand because we can give these to you. Otherwise, you're not going to have today's notes. I see one. Yeah, there's, I see, there's, I see that look hand. At, you get, here's a volunteer. Can you help me? Yeah, right thank you, guys. That would be this great. Is all, this is all because of Wednesday's weather. Correct. This is all going to be distributed Wednesday. They were to be distributed because, Wednesday. It didn't yeah. happen. Um, and if you're in the balcony, Chris Brooks has them up there. Thank you, sir. Um, so make sure you take notes. We'll explain more about how these work on Wednesday and in the, the next com coming weeks so you understand how that works. Um, yeah. So, and also, if your dog chews it up, just put it all in a bag and hand it in like that. That actually happened once to Cassie Mock, who's <laughs> avoiding eye contact right now. Okay, that's all I got. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> that's plenty. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole idea here of the scholarship, what we're going to be doing is, is, is preaching through the statement of faith over the next 10 weeks. I've put PowerPoint slides to help you guys as you're taking notes. Parents, you could take notes too and then interact with the, your teens when they get home and talk to them a little bit more about what we discussed. But the slides should help it, make it easier for you guys to take notes and get that scholarship money for, for camp. The first printing of Parenting Christian Kids is now available. Jerry has helped to put this together. Now, she didn't do all of this. We purchased this, but then she inserts things within it. Uh, this is available online. It's also available in your ABF class. It's also available at the information desk. I would highly encourage you to get a copy of this. Parents, grandparents, 
Uh, this month, starting January here, talks about a fresh start for a new year, gives some tips on how to continue discipling your children throughout the year. Uh, inside, it has a, uh, a movie review. Maybe you've seen the movie Paddington coming out. Maybe some of you kids have seen the movie Paddington that's coming out. Uh, there's a movie review here, a music review, some game site apps, things like that. And then on the back are some important dates for the month of January for our children's program. So make sure you get a copy of one of these. It's called Parenting Christian Kids. If you have a neighbor that maybe does not attend here, grab one for them and take it to the, for them also. That would be, would be great. Uh, today is the last day to RSVP for the New Attenders Luncheon next Sunday. <coughs> so excuse me, if you have been attending Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church and you called this your home church and you started to come here in 2014, you are welcome to attend the New Attenders Luncheon next Sunday. But we need to know, today's the last day. So please see me or Rachel or someone on the staff and let us know that you would like to, uh, to attend that next week and the total number um, so that we can have a record and a number for preparation for food next week. Please keep in mind, the Mulberry Street side, if you can keep that side open as far as parking for our seniors, it makes it easier for them to be able to get in the building all on one level. So if you can, if you can park in other locations, and I realize parking is, has been a problem recently, but if you can keep that Mulberry Street side for our senior folks, it makes it easier for them to get into the building. Uh, see your bulletin for other announcements. Uh, January 22nd, Washington, D.C., March for Life. Uh, there's some information in your bulletin on that. Kids Corral and other ministry opportunities. So as the men come forward, uh, we will be this morning take our tithes and offering. We're going to continue to pray for the Appleman and the Dilling family and the loss of loved ones. Uh, Ed Biddle, currently in rehab. And uh, again, Tim Edmondson, John Favor, Connie Russell, Danny Horton, and Deborah Weist, all of those uh, suffering from various health issues. So we want to continue to keep them before the Lord in prayer. So let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this uh, day that you've given us, for this opportunity that you've given us to come and to worship you. Uh, there's a lot going on here at the church, Father, in the ideas and the way of programming. But that's not what's important. What's most important is relationships, Father. I pray that we will develop relationships, meet the needs in our community around us. May we be found worthy of serving you, Father. We ask that our praise and worship would be lifted to you this morning and that it may be pleasing to you. And we thank you for an opportunity to give back to you what you have graciously provided for us. And we pray all this in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, as we mentioned, we're starting our series in what Christians believe um, this morning. And uh, just to clarify, I have full confidence in our pastor to deliver a, a good message this morning. So just, just joking. You're welcome. Um, but for the next couple weeks or, or maybe the next two months or so, um, we're going to use this as kind of our theme song at least a couple of the weeks in the, in the coming series, uh, we believe, because it just really nails what we believe as Christians. I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory, so I won't keep talking. Um, so we'll wait till the plates make it to the back, and then we'll stand together. Um, we'll start singing the song, We Believe. time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation, we believe, we believe, in this broken generation. All this dark you help us see There is only one salvation We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ 
we believe in the Holy Spirit and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and He's coming back. Let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. In our weakness and His devastations, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ. In the Holy Spirit, He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. Let the lost be found, and the dead be raised, in the here and now. That loving faith, that the church live loud. Our God will say, We believe. Gates of hell will not prevail, for the power of God is going to fail. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe that God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Let's sing that one more time. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. We
like a man away with these afflictions, he lives by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how in your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Glory to God forever. 
sung songs. We've read your word, and these songs have tried to put into our words your majesty, your greatness, your power, and your awesomeness, and we fall short, Father. Somehow the words just don't quite capture all of you. Yet, Father, you desire for us to know you. You desire to have a relationship with you. So we bend underneath the grace and mercy that you provide. And Father, I ask that you would draw near to us this morning. May we walk out of here realizing the majesty of you and the fact that you desire to know us. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Well, we've got a great deal to accomplish this morning. We're basically, in the next 25, 30 minutes, going to cover all we know about God. <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> Seriously, let's pray. Father, help us in our finite minds to understand your infiniteness, your greatness, your majesty. We bow before you and just ask that you would clarify in our minds what you would have to be revealed to us about yourself. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where to begin. Eventually we'll put some slides up there if you would, fellows, and then I can control them from up here. 
As we begin our series in what Christians believe, I think the best place to start is with the author of the scriptures, with the principal subject of the Word of God, the Bible, and that is God Himself. So as I said, in the next 25 to 30 minutes, we will cover the topic of God. And when you walk out of here, you'll be a fully certified theologian. <laughs> no, <laughs> we won't. The undertaking here this morning is virtually impossible, and it is impossible. How do we encapsulate all there is to know about God? But we will look at three uh, points. And let me see if those will come up here. Oh, one too many. There we go. We will be focusing on these three points. So for you feverishly writing notes down here in the front row, that will help get you started there. We will be looking at the Trinity, the characteristics of God and the attributes of God, and the revealing or the revelation of God. Wherever one goes and finds human beings anywhere in the world, you will also find religion. Religion is a belief in an individual or power or code that is greater than the person themselves. It's an effort to try to explain and understand and comprehend the world around us. It is in all cases the desire or the ability to create, understand, or relate to a supreme being of some kind in which our terminology refers to as God. Some people believe in a force of nature being their God. They believe in the things that they see around them possess some sort of mystical or spiritual supremacy, and they call that God. Some believe in a specific set of values. And before I go any further, I'm getting a little bit of an echo up here, just for me. I don't know, it might be coming through the monitors or something. Some believe that there's the combined effort of all humanity, that the human race collectively together, and some through the power and assistance of government, will be their God. That somehow through the combined efforts of humanity and government and society, they will be able to make things perfect and right. And so that becomes their God. Some believe in a collection of gods, that there's a multitude of gods. I remember speaking with a Catholic friend of mine, and uh, during different, different times, she would pray to the different Catholic saints. If she lost her car keys, she would pray to the saint of lost objects and items. If she was having relationship difficulties, she would pray to the saint of relationships. So she had a series of different individuals or gods that she would pray to. Like my Catholic friend, most cultures in Old Testament times subscribe to a variety of different gods. They would explain the sun with one god and the sky with another god and the earth with another god. That's what we call polytheism or the belief in many gods. They would contrive stories about these gods as to how they came into existence. Maybe one god and another god would bump into each other and a third god would come out of that. And so that's how they explain the existence of these gods and where they came from and, and how they started. In the Greek, or excuse me, in the Jewish, in the Hebrew culture, their god was quite a bit different than that. You see, in Old Testament times, with the Jews, they were monotheistic, that is, they believed in just one God, and that that God was not created, that God was eternal. He always existed and always would exist. So they didn't have stories in which they would draw up in order to determine how this God was created. This God, Yahweh, was eternal, always existed, was never created. What is more, this God had demonstrated repeatedly to the Jews that he had great power. He had the power and he proclaimed that he was the all-powerful God. And he demanded in this monotheistic religion, he demanded that he would be the one that would be worshipped. That's clearly seen in uh, the book of Exodus. The Ten Commandments. 
Exodus 20, the first and second of the Ten Commandments. Verse 2 of Exodus 20 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am, singular, the God, the one and only God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I demonstrated my power to you. Verse 3 then goes on to say, you shall have no other gods before me, meaning you don't worship anyone else. Do not bring any other gods before me in my presence. I am the only God. If you turn, we won't there, but if you turn to Deuteronomy 6, you don't have to turn this morning, the Shema, which was taught to all of the Jewish children and all the Jews knew the Shema. Moses is speaking and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In light of the Lord's declaration and about himself as being one, the Jews were fiercely monotheistic. They focused on one God, one God alone. And that was totally different than the surrounding cultures in which lived around them who were very polytheistic, had many gods. But this kind of presents a problem for us today. After all, what we're studying is what Christians believe. Christianity today has a little bit different perspective of God. Our God is a little different than the God of the Jews of the Old Testament. The God of Christianity is... One God, but made up of three persons. We refer to it as the Trinity. Please understand, men smarter than I, and that even includes Pastor Bob, have not figured out the Trinity. All right? The Trinity is something that we will make all sorts of allusions to. You can think of a hard-boiled egg, um, frozen ice and water and steam and all those things. But it will never, it can help in your mind, but it can never fully grasp what the Trinity really is. And quite frankly, I'm glad for that. See, we have an infinite God and we're finite individuals. There are just some things about God that we will not understand. There are just some things about Yahweh that will be impossible for us to wrap our minds around. We're finite and God is infinite. That supports the fact that God exists and He is all-powerful. So where did the concept of the Trinity come from? See if this helps. And you probably get extra bonus points if you scribble down that diagram in your books there. I, I don't know. Maybe Ryan will. I'm not sure if he will or not. But First of all, we have to understand that the word Trinity is not in the Scriptures. It is three individual persons, yet one essence. Wrap your mind around that. One person, one God, made up of three persons, but fully integrated together, but also individual. Just because one cannot understand the concept, though, doesn't mean that it isn't true. Three persons of God in one Godhead. These three persons all coexist equally. They're all co-eternal. They're all three co-equal, and they are inseparable. Yet... Individual entities and persons. We have God the Father. We have Jesus also as God. And then we have the Holy Spirit. We'll look at Jesus in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11 here in a few minutes. You don't have to turn there quite yet. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Oftentimes, we understand there's God the Father. And we understand Jesus Christ is also God. But sometimes we let the Holy Spirit kind of slip to the side. Sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, an equal, co-existent, co-eternal, co-equal, co-powerful part of the Trinity. And here in Acts chapter 5, the first four verses, we see a demonstration of that. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, a man named, I'm sorry, I should have told you, uh, in your pew Bibles, it's page 593, if you're using your pew Bibles, page 593. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Little side note here, he sold some property, told the people that he was going to give them all the money, when in reality he didn't. He kept some back for himself. That's kind of the secondary part of the story here. In verse 3, then Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept 
for yourself some of the money you didn't receive for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Well, well, wait a minute there. At the end of verse 3, he says you lie to the Holy Spirit. At the end of verse 4, he says you lied to God. That's because the Holy Spirit and God are equal. Holy Spirit and God are equal. And that's why Peter uses them that way in this passage. So we have three gods, right? Well, no, we don't. While it may appear that way, we have three persons, yet those three persons equally function together as one God. Confused? That's why I said it's going to be hard for you to wrap your mind around this. And men smarter than myself have wrestled this for thousands of years. But consider the following passages. Think about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God here is the word Elohim, which is a plural form of the word God, Elohim. Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. Speaking of the creation of man and woman, God says, let us. Well, who is he referring to? No one else has been created yet. He says, let us make man in our image. So he's obviously talking in the plural. There's three entities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit present. Genesis eleven seven, 7, the story of the Tower of Babel. The people were supposed to spread out over all of the land and occupy all of the land, not to gather around together, and they came together, they clumped together to form a city and built a tower. And so God says to them, let us go down and confuse their language. Let us, plural, multiple, the Trinity. So while we do have one God, one singular entity, it's made up of three individual persons at the baptism of jesus christ you see all three persons of the godhead the father is there pronouncing that this is my son in whom i am well pleased the holy spirit descends like a dove and jesus christ the actual son of god being baptized and finally in matthew 28 19 we are called as followers of christ to go and to baptize all nations in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit so while we have one God collectively, that God is made of three parts. This God is made up of three persons. Jesus would often pray to his Father. He was not praying to himself, but to another entity, another person. Jesus would also state in the Gospel of John that his Father would one day send the Holy Spirit, a comforter, to replace himself, to take the place of Jesus Christ. So while we see one God we see three different persons. But when we consider the Trinity, while each is fully God, we also have to understand that these persons would sometimes subordinate themselves to the other parts of the Trinity. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. That's on page 636. 636. Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, the first 11 verses, this passage is known as the kenosis passage. That's a big theological term, speaking of the Trinity of God, because you're going to see all three parts. As we're reading through this, see if you can pull out the three different parts or entities of the Trinity. If you have any encouragement in verse 1 from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, notice capital S, any fellowship with the Spirit, capital S, that's not like you know, we've got spirit, how about you, we, you know, the, the cheer, right? That's lowercase s. This is capital S. Different story here, all right? If any tenderness, if any compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, lowercase, and, pur and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also the interest of others. Okay, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. There's the second part of the Trinity. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. 
being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And verses 9 through 11 go to his exaltation, where God the Father even says that my son will be exalted to the same supremacy as myself. So we see in the Trinity, we see the three different parts, but at times... The parts of the Trinity were subordinate to others and took on a different uh, subordinating role. God the Father, the planner, the creator, the sustainer. He completes his work of salvation and redemption through his son, Jesus Christ, who carries out the plan in submission to God the Father. And he does this through the power of the Holy Spirit, the other part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers Jesus to do his work. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals God to us. So while the single Godhead is made up of three persons, we must be sure that we understand that none of them has supremacy over the other. They are not forms of God. They are God. Did I say something that was... (laughs) I thought I was theologically correct. I, Ryan, you started all this. <laughs> you did. I, I think it all started there. I believe that everything is... The, Pastor Bob, am I theologically correct? I mean, right? Yeah, okay, go on. All right, okay. All right, where, my point was this. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are not forms of God. They are actually God. Characteristics and attributes, though, about God. Let's pull those up characteristics and attributes of God the Father. Attributes describe something we know about something or someone. So how does one describe the characteristics of God? For example, we say that God is infinite and eternal. Well, what does that mean? How do we wrap our mind around that? Well, it's, it's been a while since I've thrown my wife under the bus, so I think I will do that this morning in making this illustration, but I should receive a few brownie points because to use your wife as an illustration when talking about the characteristics of God, you can't go wrong there, right? I I would think. So if I told you that my wife is a very loving, caring, and giving person, or if I told you that she has a bad temper and a short fuse, you would have a pretty good understanding of what I'm referring to her, how I'm describing her, the characteristics, right? And how do you know that? Well, because you've experienced other individuals that are very loving and caring and giving. Or you yourself or someone else that you know may have a short temper or a short fuse and get angry very quickly. You see, because you have something to relate to, to identify the words that I'm describing Shelley with, you have a point of reference. That's called God's communicable attributes. Those are the characteristics and attributes of God that we also possess. So we have a point of reference, a way of understanding things like charity and anger and mercy and love and justice. You see, you've seen these things in other people, so you have a point of reference. They're called communicable attributes of God. But if I tell you that Shelley is omnipresent, even though my sons often thought that she was, omnipresent being everywhere all at once, um, you don't really have any point of reference with respect to that. Or, as I sometimes believe she's all-powerful, omnipotent or omnipotent, I think sometimes she is, you really don't have any point of reference with respect to this. These are what theologians call incommunicable attributes. They don't have a human counterpart. We really don't have any point of reference to understand what it means. And by the way, just as a side note, when we say that God is omnipresent, we say oftentimes that he's everywhere. Um, Dr. David Plaster had a different perspective. He said everything is in the presence of God. God is not everywhere, but everything is in the presence of God. That'll give you something to think about and discuss around the lunch table this afternoon. But how do we know the attributes of God? Where can we see the character of God? You see, pagans constructed their own gods, so they wrote their own characteristics. But God had to reveal himself 
to us. The God of the Christian faith is different. So how does he reveal who he is to us? How does he show us his personality? Well, let's take a look at how God reveals himself to us. He reveals himself through many ways, but I've just brought out a few of them here. Through creation. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. That's on page 610 in the Pew Bible. 610. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. How does God reveal his characteristics, his attributes, what he's all about, what he's like? How do we know what God is like? Well, he reveals himself through creation. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. How? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. The first thing in the passage, it says that God is being revealed. It's ongoing. It's not that it's concluded. He reveals himself to us day by day by day. He is being revealed. It also says in verse 20 that individuals suppress the truth. That is, all people know that God exists. All people know it. They suppress the truth of what is blatantly obvious to them directly before their eyes as they look out and as we see the mountains, we see the snowfall, we see the birth of a child, we see the miraculous creation of God. Individuals will suppress that truth. They will deny that there's a God when in fact creation screams that he exists. It also says that through creation, his invisible qualities, those are the incommunicable attributes we talked about, his eternal power, his command over the universe, his divine nature, When we see all of these things together, one cannot help but realize that there is a divine supreme being by the name of God that put all of this in place. We also know that um, God exists and God reveals himself through our conscience. Since God is the creator of all things, including man himself, he imparted within each one of us his image. So God's image is implanted within each one of us. The communicable attributes that we talked about, love, justice, mercy. The conscience, the human conscience, is one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God. C.S. Lewis describes it this way. Let's say for a moment that you are on a bus, on a city bus, and the entire bus is filled with people. There are no extra seats. The bus stops and a man gets on the bus and comes in, and since there are no seats available on the bus, he stands. A little woman, a couple of seats in front of you, takes a book, a magazine, and moves up a couple of seats to hand the magazine to her daughter that is also riding the bus. So she gets up out of her seat, moves forward a little bit, hands her the magazine, and as soon as she stands up, the man that's standing jumps in her seat and sits down and takes her place. How do you feel about that? Is there anybody on that bus that's going to say, you know, it's okay that you did that? Everybody on that bus has a moral conscience, an understanding that there's something here that isn't right. There's something here that wasn't ethical. She was there first, and you took her spot. Everybody on that bus has a realization that wrong has been committed. That's the image of God in morality. Morality and and ethics, they don't evolve. You can't evolve. I mean, how do you have survival of the fittest, eat or be eaten, and then all of a sudden decide, okay, I'm going to fall under a different law, a moral law that is one that describes justice. You can't have that evolve. That's been created. That's been placed into each one of us. Now, we can suppress that. We can deny it. We can sit there on the bus and not even say anything to the man that took her seat. We can suppress what we know is right. We can suppress our conscience. But in reality, we still can't deny the fact that God has placed within us a moral, ethical code. Look at Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Just flip over one page. 
Paul talks about this. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, that was God's way of helping them with their conscience and morality, Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature, what is he saying there? Do by nature what God has instilled within each one of us. Things required by the law, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. I know this is getting a little confusing, but watch what he does here. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, in their consciences, also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. What Paul's saying here is that even the Gentiles who don't know who God is, it's instilled within them a conscience that God has placed within them a moral code of right and wrong, demonstrating the existence of God and revealing God's nature for truth, for justice. We also see God revealed through Scripture, historic events. Repeatedly, we see in the Old Testament, God used surrounding nations to draw the children of Israel back to himself. He worked through people. He worked through history. If you turn over a couple pages to Romans chapter 9, we see an illustration of this. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. Actually, you can just start in verse 17. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. The point here, God works through history. He works through personalities. He works through people to reveal himself and to accomplish his intended goal, whatever God chooses to accomplish. He works through people and personalities and through history. But God also reveals himself through Jesus Christ. And now we're going to study Christ himself next week. Um, by the way, in your bulletin is the handout. It looks something like this. That will be the order that we will be looking at the, um, the various studies throughout. We'll be going right down the page there. So as you can see, next week we'll be looking at Jesus Christ and, and, and studying him. We refer to the act of the second person of the Trinity taking on human form as the incarnation. Let's make sure we're clear on this. Jesus is not simply God in a body. Okay, oftentimes that's how you hear it spoken. Jesus is not simply God in a body. He is God that took on human attributes. He is fully God and took on all that it means to be human. Again, Jesus is the person of God that added humanity to himself. Jesus Christ is our best revelation of God the Father. Jesus tells us that he speaks only what the Father speaks, and he does only what the Father tells him to do. So he reveals the character and nature of God. Your Pew Bible, page 586, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, page 586. <clears throat> John 14, verse 5, page 586 in your pew Bible. Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going to, 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 to die, and he's going to, put to his father's house who's prepared a place for him. And Thomas said to him in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The words Jesus speaks are not just his words. They're revelation of who God the Father is. Jesus says that the things he does are not a result of the Father living him as he's doing the Father's work. Make sure you keep your finger there in John chapter 14. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So, we have seen that the Godhead is made up of the Trinity, three individuals, three persons, yet one God. We've considered the attributes and the qualities of this God, what he is like and what abilities he possesses. And we've looked at how God shows those attributes through us, how he reveals to us his character and who he is through creation and history and persons and individuals and our conscience and the Son of God himself. It's pretty amazing stuff. It's pretty amazing stuff. But what's the point of all this? 
Is the goal here this morning to spend 25 minutes to learn some interesting factoids about God? Is that the true purpose of this? Well, it's partly true, and it's important. If we walk out of here with that perspective, we've missed the whole idea. You see, we've had a great theology lesson. We've learned some interesting things about God. But you want to know what really blows my mind? What really blows my mind is this. This God that we just described and talked about, He wants you to know Him. He wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with each and every one of you. He doesn't want you to just know about Him. He wants you to know Him, to understand Him. He wants you to worship Him. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to have a relationship with you. And check out this statement by J.I. Packer from his book, Knowing God. It says this, Revelation, the revealing of God, is a divine activity. It's not, therefore, a human achievement. That is, understanding about God isn't about our achievement. Revelation is not the same thing as discovering or the dawning of insight or the emerging of a bright idea. Revelation does not mean man finding God, but God finding man. God sharing his secrets with us. God showing himself to us. You see, it's not about us sitting here discovering God. It's about us sitting here and God showing us who he is and revealing himself to us. Hear me now. God does not want us to know about him so much as he wants us to know him. It's not about knowing about God, it's about knowing Him. God desires for us to have a relationship with Him. That's where Christianity separates itself from all other religions. See, our God is not distant and cold. Our God is not like the God of Islam that says, in order to get to heaven, you have to carry out these five requirements. Our God is not like the Hindu God, Brahma. That God prides himself in the fact that you can never know me. The Hindu God says, you can never understand me. You can never have a relationship with me. I'm too majestic, too powerful. You can never have any intimate relationship or know me. See, that's where the God of Christianity is different. Look back again at that John chapter 14 passage. Consider verses 6 and 7. One more time. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Jesus makes it very clear to his disciples of how imperative it is that they see who God the Father is. Jesus wants them, listen guys, don't miss this, because through what you've seen in me, you can see God the Father. You can have a relationship and a knowledge of Him. Earlier, in verses 1 through 4, Jesus talks about, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God, trust also in me. He talks about in His Father's house are many rooms and many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. Verse 3, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. There's even more information for you and more revelation. Not only does God want just an intimate spiritual relationship, but he intends to have us in his very presence. He desires to have us come and live with him, to be with him in his very presence. One last passage. Flip a couple pages to John 17. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, eternal life, eternal presence with God the Father. This is eternal life, that they, you and I, and the disciples, and all may know you, who? God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life and life itself is wrapped up in knowing God. Want purpose to your life? 
undertake the understanding and realizing that there's a relationship that you can have with God the Father. Want value? Want a challenge? Know that you can know God, that you can understand God, and He desires to have a relationship with you. The rest of our topics over the next nine weeks are basically focused around this same concept. In all of those different aspects of our statement as to what Christians believe, it's all about knowing God. It's all about having a relationship with Him. Take pleasure, peace, and comfort in the fact that the God of the universe wants you to know Him, and He desires for you to have a relationship with Him. Let's pray. Father, we are astounded at your greatness. We are astounded that there are concepts about you that you have revealed to us that we cannot fully comprehend. While we understand that there is one God and three persons, that's challenging for us, Father, to understand. But that's okay, because you are an infinite God, a great God, an all-powerful God. Help us to know you, not just know about you. While you reveal yourself through your word and through your son, Father, and, and we read the gospels and we, we see you revealed to us, it's not just about knowing about you, but knowing you personally and intimately. Father, if there's someone here this morning that just, they don't know you, your word right there in John 14 says, no one comes to the Father, to you, God, except through Jesus Christ. Lead us, Father. Draw us to yourself. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing.
are created in the very image of the God that we worship. He has placed within us a desire to know him. As Pastor Jim Laird used to say, there's a God-shaped hole in each of us. And while the world may tell us that we can put different things in that hole, there's only one thing that fits, and that's God, and a desire to know him. If you don't know this God through Jesus Christ and the power of his death, burial, and resurrection, we'd love to talk with you. We'd love to share that with you. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your son. We thank you for who you are, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the power and the majesty that you display all around us, Father, and that you continue to reveal yourself to us. The purpose of that revelation is so that we can know you Father, draw us close to yourself. Draw us to you. May we follow hard after you and to know you. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen.